recorded or not? Recording. Oh, recording. There we go. So now all of our recording. banter in the beginning will be there. So that's how it was the next. So okay. are you okay with my ink? Yes. Okay, it's good. So yeah, it's over there. We're good. I just don't want to roast the back of our legs. I feel like we could be doing an Abbott and Costello routine up here. <laughs> I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes. Um, for uh, this section, um, oftentimes, Stacey Cordner is the only one that she's up. She's uh, a good girl. Not, yeah. <laughs> not unusual. It's not uh, unusual to be. It's a musical. <laughs> it's 10.04, so I guess we'll get started then. Um, so we're going to go over chapter 480, Massage Law, as well as the rules chapters of 6.4 B7 Florida Administrative Codes. You'll find those in MindTap. And we're going to also go over the highlights that are in the study guide. So if you don't have those printed out and you just want to take notes, then that's what you can do. And then we're going to go from there and jump into the chair massage packet and paper assignment as well. So stop us if you have any questions, wave if we don't notice you or whatever you need to do, and uh, we'll backtrack. All right. So um, we're going to go over actually the names of the laws. It's Massage Practice Act, Chapter 480, which is important to know. And the massage rule in Florida is Chapter 64B as in Boy 7, Administrative Codes. And we're going to go over the purpose of massage law. And I, since it's just us, we can kind of talk back and forth. Are you muted right now? You are? Yeah, okay. I'm not. So, no. Okay. So what do you think is the, the purpose of massage law, uh, for us having massage law? Uh, isn't it to uh, get the prostitutions out of it? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> to keep the public safe. Right, to oh, keep right. us professional, <laughs> to, safe, to right. get rid of those unqualified people who aren't licensed. So they define it in our study guide as the purpose of massage law is to protect the public from unqualified practice of massage, unqualified equals unlicensed or negligent. The law allows the public recourse through legal remedies and it allows for both civil and criminal prosecution. So, and that is a highlight in your study packet. Okay. And then they go on and they define massage in Florida as the manipulation of soft tissue of the human body with hand, foot, arm, or elbow. Whether or not such manipulation is aided by hydrotherapy, including colonic irrigation or thermal therapy, any electrical or mechanical devices or the application of the human body of a chemical or herbal preparation. So we can do body wraps and things like that as well. Um, in 1998, the board ruled that ultrasound, electrical stimulation, any mechanical or electrical device may be used by a therapist who is competent to use the device. So, and I don't know if you, have you already done chapter two and three ethics? You can just do thumb up or thumb down if you're muted. So you kind of learned the difference between you may be allowed to use something, but whether or not you are qualified to use it is a different story, right? We've always got this responsibility to uh, make sure that we're not negligent in doing something that we're not qualified to do. Like um, I know a therapist who saw a YouTube video on ear candling, thought it was supposed to be dripping earwax down into the ear, didn't think it was doing it right, burned the person's hair. She'd never done ear candling training or anything, just watched a YouTube video. So even though we can do ear candling, she should not have been doing ear candling, right? So that's where that negligent comes in. If you willfully injure somebody where you, you know, even if you accidentally injure somebody. So the laws are there to protect you in that way as well. Um, we have a relationship with the Department of Health and the Board of Massage. We are regulated by the Department of Health, um, whereas like Cosmo and estheticians are regulated by the Board of Cosmetology, which is also why we, as when you're a student here, cannot accept tips like you could in skincare because we're under the Department of Health. So no tips 
for massage therapy students because Department of Health says that's a no-go, Okay. right? So um, Department of Health is the oversight agency for the Board of Massage and other healthcare providers. The functions of the Department of Health, they issue licenses to practitioners, they collect money from practitioners, and they investigate complaints against practitioners. So what you really wanna know is that we're regulated by Department of Health, and they're the ones who assign the Board of Massage, and we'll go a little bit more into that as well. The Board of Massage themselves, they regulate our profession through rulemaking and regulation of profession through disciplinary action. So that's what the Board of Massage that Department of Health creates does for us. Um, regard, uh, some facts regarding the board. There are seven members, you'll wanna know this, it's an important um, highlight. Of those seven members, five are licensed massage therapists with five years licensure. And the other two represent the public. And the reason we want those five who have five years experience as LMTs is because they've, they've kind of discovered what does and doesn't work, right? They kind of have discovered through practice where things can become complicated, like relationships with clients and therapists and things like that. So it's important to have those members and then those two represent, representing the public give us that non-therapist view on what the public wants to see regulated and happen within our profession. The board is required by law to have one meeting in January where they elect chairmen and vice chairmen. Um, and then the chairman calls for meetings as needed. Members may hold, and this is important. I'll go back to that. Members may hold two four-year, is that, I'm reading that correctly, two four-year terms, full or partial. And also important to, to note is that the governor, the board is accountable directly to the governor because the members are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. So the governor actually appoints that board. They report to him. He's accountable. not just some mysterious tribunal. Yeah, so they actually, yeah. Um, they have to have a quorum of at least four to have a legal meeting. They have to publish their meeting seven days in advance and they have to adhere to guidelines. And also important to know is they must be a US citizen and Florida resident for five years and hold a high school diploma or GED. And of course, you have to have a diploma or a GED to be an LMT. So those kind of go hand in hand. So we're going to go over a little bit of obtaining a license in Florida. The board has the thor um, sole authority to issue the license um, to one who has met all the requirements of education and examination. Um, the board's application for licensure asks questions related to arrest history, drug, alcohol, job history, um, uh, drug, alcohol abuse, sorry. Um, they now have access to a FDLE computer as well to see what the background is. And they have, um, you have three methods to attain a license. You can attend a board approved school like Sun State for a minimum of 500 clock hours, no more than six hours a day or 30 hours a week. That's why we're such sticklers about clocking out for lunch and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Apprenticeship is also a possibility. Apprenticeship is a minimum of 1,473 hours. 700 of those hours are hands-on. So if you find somebody to offer you apprenticeship, you have to do a lot more than when you go to school. 1,473 hours and 700 of them hands-on. It has to take place in a licensed establishment under supervision of an LMT with three years experience. Um, and it has to be no less, it's got a window of 12 months to 24 months, no less than 12 months, no more than 24 months that that has to be completed in. So that person has to basically be working full time during that apprenticeship for free, right? Because they're under Department of Health. And, um, 
Then we have examination in Florida. Once you receive your candidate number, you have 90 days. I said there are three methods. I just have school and apprenticeship. Oh, via an endorsement, sorry. One has met all the educational and examination requirements of Florida coming from another state, which licensed practitioner have no unresolved complaints against them. So when you did chapter two and three, you probably learned about portability <coughs> of your license and whether or not it can go to another state and what those state requirements are. Um, depending on what state they're coming from, you could be endorsed if you've met all the requirements that our state has. Okay. So that's the third way. So once you receive your candidate number, you have 90 days to schedule your exam. And that's why we <clears throat> try to get you scheduled as soon as you're finished with the requirements we have here, like massage prep and your curriculum and everything else. Um, you may attempt the exam multiple times and fail, but you must pay for each attempt. So, and of course we really want you to pass it on the first go. An important note to take, you must pass the Federation of State Massage Therapy FSMTD test, which is the MBLEX, which stands for Massage and Body Work Licensing Exam. The cost to take the MBLEX is $195. Once the test is passed, you must apply to Tallahassee for your license, and the cost is $155. And that is your first time, that is not your renewal cost when you're applying. So it's uh, $100 for the two-year license, $50 administrative fee, $5 offset for legal fees. So that is the first time that you apply. After that, the renewal, you no longer have that um, $50 administrative fee goes down to $105. Good. Any questions? Good for two years. Hmm? Good for two years. And we're going to go over that date as well. Yeah. Does it, is it further back? I have a note there to talk about it. I also it, have a note to talk about it. So. All right. So once you receive your license, and this may come up as we're going through it further in, you're going to receive what's called your MA number. And as we go through and we talk about um, some of the laws and rules, you'll discover that MA number, which is your massage license number, your LMT number, is required to be on any type of advertisement that goes out there. And then if you become an establishment, you get what's called an MM number. And whether or not that's required depends on um, if you're if you're um, like, say you're a licensed massage therapist and you have a business, but you're only going into clients' homes, then you don't have to worry about an establishment license. You have to have that establishment license though if people are coming to your location. And then that MM number will be required to be on everything as well. And I think we go a little bit further into that when we get further into, into the yeah, rules, establishment, establishment rules and things like that. Um, Requirements for licensure, you need a passport style headshot for your license application. You do not need to be a Florida resident. You may hold multiple state licenses. And I do know some people who have um, their massage therapy license in multiple states. The worst thing you can do if you've gone through all that work to become licensed is to let it go. Even if you don't know if you're going to return back to whatever state you were in before, you, you just never know. So it's always a good idea if you have multiple states and or even multiple licenses because you're, you're doing dual, right? Your spa therapies. Yeah. So you always want to keep both up. A friend of mine kept her skincare up, but not her massage. And now she's thinking about going back into it like eight years later. And she could have just, even though she wasn't using it, she could have just kept that up every two it's years. It's going to be more expensive in the long run to, yeah, to get it back use. than it would have been to just keep it. it. Yep. Um, you must be 18 years old and have a high school diploma or GED. We already went over you have to be trained through a board approved school or apprenticeship. You have to have passed your MBLEX exam. You have to submit fingerprints. And when you're close to being finished, we give you your, um, your spa therapies uh, 
exit packet. It'll actually have information in there as to a place that's close by to be able to go do your fingerprinting and everything. Um, you have, you must have completed application and paid the application fee, that 155 we talked about, and you must meet requirements of endorsement if out of state. So the endorsement if you're coming in, whether or not it's portable. And I'm gonna let Christina take over with massage establishment licenses. Okay, so massage establishment licenses. We talked a little bit about that MM number. That's going to be your massage establishment, right? MA is for the person and M is for the establishment, the place that you're working at. Um, so we have apply inspection license. Can't practice an establishment unless you have an establishment license. So you can change the name of the establishment. Um, requires a change of name with the board, change location, requires a change in a reinspection. Um, you cannot give or sell an establishment license to a new owner. So if you had the establishment license and you're leaving that location and someone else is coming in as an LMT behind you to work in that location, they have to acquire their own establishment license. Um, must have property damage and bodily injury liability insurance when filing application and plan on a 30 to 60 day wait because slowly turn the wheels of insurance. <laughs> um, definition of site or premises or portion thereof in which massage therapy is practiced. All such sites must be licensed by the state, right? And here's a highlight for you. Such license is biennial. biennial. That's every two years, right? Renewable by the same date as the massage license, which is August 31st of every odd year. So 2021 comes up, you do your massage personal license and your establishment license. Um, issued to an owner slash agent at a particular address under a specific name. So the establishment is linked to that person and that address, not just to the person you know, wherever they go. It's just that place only. Right, you have to apply to actually change the location of the establishment and let it get approved if you're moving to a different building or a different place. They don't want business. people just popping up everywhere like, oh, I have an establishment license. I can do it on the street here and I can do it in the corner over here. It's okay. gotta be. Yeah, an establishment license is the license for the establishment. Yep. Just the place. So they have, it requires an inspection to make sure that you have the appropriate material that you need in order to conduct the massage safely. You have laundry facilities. You don't have 12 Chinese girls shoved under your table. Like everything is up and up. Yeah. Um, so if someone else purchases that establishment, that triggers a new inspection. Because if yeah. you're an owner, you don't know what to expect. A new location triggers a new inspection. And you I can, can show you the name. Mm -hmm. But if you change to, owners or you change location, that is the establishment. Yep, and you have to actually apply to change the name too. You have to be yes. really specific about the name. I found out um, the hard way when I applied for mine when I was leasing in um, a yoga studio. The person that came in to inspect came the day I wasn't there. I was in the middle of moving from Orlando. Even though I had done the application under my name with my business name, they put it under Lotus Pond for the yoga center because that's the, the building liability insurance, not my personal hands-on liability insurance. And I was going to be required to advertise as Lotus Pond, which the yoga studio didn't want because I was my own entity. I had to go back in before I could advertise and apply to have the name changed, even though they had made the error, the error there because legally, you have to advertise the name that's associated with that MM number, right? So I couldn't, I couldn't advertise, I am Bliss Massage Tampa. I would have had to advertise the Lotus Pond, which was the yoga center. So you have to be real specific about what name you want on there and everything because they're, they're strict about the advertising. Okay. And that it all has to be tagged back to those MAs and MM numbers. Um, where did I leave off? Oh, okay. Massage establishment licenses are not required, this is a highlight, at the following events. Sporting events, health fairs, conventions, homes or offices of clients, and trade shows are exempt. 
right? But you still need to get written permission to be on the property for the event. Uh, the state and its political subdivisions are exempt, which I don't exactly know what that sentence means. I mean, Rick Scott can, they can do what they do want. What he wants to do. Rude. Yeah. Okay. That's you'll find on almost all of those codes, you'll find that the <laughs> up and up guys are yeah. exempt. Okay. Um, a few more nuances within uh, the massage establishment. Massage establishments may not operate between the hours of 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. So if you see places operating after 10, eh, probably don't want to go there. <laughs> Um, but there are exceptions. There's always exceptions to rules. Um, certain healthcare facilities, hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts, timeshare properties, public airports, pari mutual facilities, casinos and dog tracks. Is that what those are? Yeah, that's the technical term. Yep. Um, or approved uh, special events. And this does not apply to establishments at which massages are performed between midnight and 5 a.m. and are under the direction of a physician, physician assistant, DO, DC, ARNP, or dentist. So there's exceptions to the rules. You just have to make sure that you qualify for those exceptions so you don't get popped <laughs> or fined because they have plenty of fines to hand out if you're not following the rules. Um, sure. Okay, so compensation. We talked a little bit about this at the beginning. Students may not accept compensation from internships, internship clients, or with any other person. This would be practicing without a license. If you're being compensated for any manipulation of soft tissue of the human body, you must be a licensed massage therapist or other licensed professional. Compensation doesn't just mean money. It means the receipt of anything of value, right? A paperclip has value. A paperclip has value, a gift cards, fruit basket. If it Box has anything, anything, a Hallmark card, doesn't matter. And I'm just going to chime in. It's mm -hmm. not worth it for three or four or five dollars because um, even if you think like somebody hands you cash that nobody's going to find out, sometimes it, it happens. We had a student who um, the front desk came back and told me, one of your students accepted a tip. And I'm like, how do you know? And they said, well, I asked them at the end of their hair service if they wanted to add a tip to their credit card. And they said, well, I already gave the massage student cash, but yeah, let's add it for the Cosmo. I didn't have enough. And so we had to go back to that massage student and say, you gotta, you gotta hand it over. You know, there's just, it's not worth it while you're getting your license. And even if the, the uh, client is insisting here in the clinic, I mean, you just have to tell them, bring out, bust your rules out and be like, according to Florida law, we cannot accept tips and just, Stop it there. And if they insist, they can give it to the front desk. And, but yeah. you will not get it. All right. So another highlight, uh, exemptions to professional licensure. Um, one is an athletic trainer acting on behalf of a professional team training in the state of Florida. Uh, the state and its political subdivisions other healthcare professionals whose own profession overlaps with massage, like a chiropractor, right? So those are gonna be your exceptions to where they can perform manipulations on people. Okay. Right? So certain professions, their job requires that they manipulate the soft tissue of the human body, but they don't need a massage license to do it. Um, podiatrists, chiropractors, nurses, physicians, dentists, um, sports trainers, all of these people in their line of work will have to touch someone. They do not require a massage license. Okay. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Advertisement. Whatever you advertise must have a license number exhibited or mentioned or printed, whether establishment, professional, or both. Always put both, just put both. <laughs> yeah. It just, it's 
covers everything. You've got everything you need there, who you are, where you're at. Those two numbers will tell them everything they need to know. Keeps you above board. I just found it to be easier. Print it right on there and yeah. be done with it. Um, now, colonic therapy and hygiene. Cleansing the colon with water therapy covered by massage license but requires separate training of 100 hours and a separate examination among the 100 hours. 45 of those hours must be practical hours. So that's for colonic irrigation. Okay. Did you ever do any training in that? No, nope, me either. Don't wanna. Not interested. Not <laughs> but there's plenty of people who do it. There's, you know, if it's something you're interested in, that's there's a market for it. Okay. Great. And so I was talking a little bit earlier about disciplinary actions and fines that they're, you know, you're not doing the right things ready to hand, hand out. And here is some of those um, disciplinary actions. A citation may be issued for minor infractions, thus saving the board disciplinary hearing time. These are actually issued by the department, usually when an inspection is done and there was no debating the issue. They come in, they look around and they say, you're not doing this. Write it down, hand it to you. There you go. You, they're not going to have a lengthy court process with the board. It's just like, nope, we saw it. It's wrong. Um, disciplinary action is taken by the board after a probable cause panel recommends a disciplinary hearing before the board. At the hearing, the therapist can bring witnesses and or a lawyer. So whatever you have to disprove your case or argue your case, you can bring with you. So here is what I will tell you. The Board of Massage convenes to protect the public. You hear that? I hear protect you. the public, not you, not the therapist. The Board of Massage is not your friend. No one gets called before the Board of Massage because you've been doing such a great job, because you're such a good therapist. The Board of Massage is like a judge. You only get called before the judge because you messed up. And if you get called before the judge, you need an attorney. If you get called before the Board of Massage, I would recommend that you at least speak with an attorney who does licensure law because they are not on your side. They are on the public's side. They are there to protect the public from you. So a, a perfectly executed massage career, you will go decades of doing massages. You'll never know if it's on the board of massage. That, that is a fantastic career. You ne never have any reason to know who the board members are. Yeah. But the board of massage is there <laughs> to protect the public. They are not your friends. That's why your soap notes are so important, um, especially it, like I always, when I was at um, one of the franchises, I always ask the client, okay to work the glutes, on the skin, over the sheet, whatever was allowed at that location. And I would even say, so we're working the glutes again today, if they were coming back, I always put in my soap notes, client said okay to work the glutes over the sheet, or you know lateral on the skin or whatever i always put a note if they said you know like you you want to consistently keep notes and records of what you're doing um and do them properly no no white out no erasing only annotations to your notes if you have to change something or add something onto it because if you if you've erased something or you've put white out on it it's no longer admissible in court you always want to keep good records of everything that you're doing. Over document. Over document. CYA. Yep. It's the best thing you can do. And you will find discrepancies sometimes even in things like the inspection. So just because, like this is what I ran into. Um, the first person that inspected my establishment, I had a closet that had cur pretty curtains in front of it. All my linens were on the shelf. They said, the person who inspected me the next time I needed to be inspected said, I'll come back tomorrow, those need to be in a closed in container, like something with doors or Tupperware. So the first person, it didn't matter to, but technically the second person said curtains are not a closed in space and I had to get like a big plastic bin and put them in that because I didn't have closet doors for my linen. So you wanna just make sure you follow to a T. And after that, I was like, they're always gonna be in that in case I get inspected because 
you know, one person was a little bit more lenient when they came in and the other person was to the T how they wanted everything to look. Okay. Yeah, so behind a cabinet door in plastic sealed. Protected. Whatever the laws say at that current time. Yeah. And so you have to kind of do your due diligence and in, in research that if, if things have changed, you know, make sure that you're up to date on all of it. If something changed within an establishment license or your personal license. Like when I got licensed initially, they didn't do fingerprinting. And then they sent me a notice probably four or five years in, like, this is something you need to go do right now. We are fingerprinting all massage therapists. And I was just, I don't know where, oh, okay. But it was to maintain licensure, I needed to do it. So. Yeah, ignorance doesn't, if you don't know the law, no it, doesn't, excuse. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You have to research. Like I had to do so much research and little things that I wasn't even aware of, like the massage table had one little scratch on it where if somebody had bodily fluids, it could have gotten in there and I had to order a cover. And it was like the tiniest little scratch. Oh, through the vinyl. Yeah, where it was like the tiniest little scratch, but because it could potentially have something through there, I had to get a cover. Like you've got to research and know every little thing if you're gonna get inspected and all that kind of stuff to, because they're not gonna care if you don't know. I was lucky they said they'd come back the next day. Another one could have said they would come back in two weeks or a month or I could go through the whole process and apply again. So they're research. They're reasonable people though. Like they, they, they come in and they're nice and polite, maybe a little curt, but you know, they've, they've got their whole area that they have to service. And by the time they get done on one side, they got to turn around and go back and do it all over again. So yeah. they come in with their little laptop how trolley often bag. Do they come by? How often? Mm -hmm. Inspections? They drop in once a year, don't they? Yeah, I had, I had somebody drop in um, like six months after the first time calendar randomly year. and they don't tell you when they're coming they didn't even tell me on the first inspection i was still in orlando moving to when tampa the first inspection they'll schedule with you they didn't they just came in they just came in when to... i got inspected they we set up a date and time for the first one and then after that they could drop in monday through friday normal business hours they didn't the, schedule the first mine. One was scheduled they just came in and i was still in orlando trying to move to tampa and luckily the, the yoga center that I was leasing space inside, it was open to let them in and show them around and all that kind of stuff. And I rushed over with the cover for my table and all the little things I needed to fix. Yeah, um, and they don't do 12 months to 12 months. It might be six months in between, as long as they're, as long as they're in two different calendar years that they're stopping by in, in for the inspection because, um, the inspector that I had, her and I worked together every year for a long time. Mm. And I, I, I looked at the calendar, I'm like, weren't you just here? And she went, Ch -ch 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 -ch. and she said, yep, I was here five months ago, but it was last year, technically. And I'm like, all right, well, there you go. And she went and did her thing. And it was, you know, they're, they're in and out. They don't want to disrupt your work schedule. They work with you. Okay. But they want to make sure you're doing everything right. Right. All right. Um, where did I leave off? Let's see. Oh, the lawyer. Okay. Disciplinary action is taken against practitioners guilty of misconduct or negligence or malpractice. Um, misconduct deals with generally with the way one conducts themselves in business. Negligence, malpractice deals with the lack of care given to the client. So you, it may be ignorant negligence, but you will still have the disciplinary actions that go with that. Or you may know better and still be negligent and you'll get the disciplinary actions that go with whatever that negligent act falls under. Yeah, the burden of proof that it wasn't willful and intentional would be on you. That it was, and you'd, you'd still be in the wrong. There'd just probably be a different level of fine mm -hmm. and trouble you'd get in and if it was complete ignorance versus I intentionally ear candled and set their hair on fire, you know? <laughs> I feel like if you're lighting something on fire, you, you're pretty present in what you're doing. <laughs> okay. Um, action may include a letter of reprimand, so they're gonna yell at you, uh, sus suspension, revocation, and or a fine. They will also charge uh, cost of prosecution if found guilty. If fine, usually must pay in 30 days. Um, I'm not familiar with any of that. I've never been fined before, so I 
can't speak to any personal experiences with disciplinary actions. Um, I, in fact, don't know anyone who's been fine, actually. I don't either. <laughs> um, do you want to pick up there? Inspections? Or do you want me to keep going? I'll pick up there if you want. Sure. All right, so inspections take place unannounced during normal business hours. You must have licenses displayed conspicuously, and you've got to have that photo on there so they know who it belongs to. You cannot refuse an inspection, an inspector access to um, inspect any part of your establishment. A denial must be in writing with reasons for denial noted. Only, only need a shower if you have a whirlpool, sauna, shower, steam room, or pool. Um, I think I read somewhere now that you have to have one if you're doing body wraps too, but I'm not sure if that's the case. But you do have to have a bathroom with running water, but you only need the shower if they're using the sauna, shower, steam room, or pool. Colonics must be done in an establishment. So no in-home colonics. There are annual and periodic inspections. The inspections look for the following, unobstructed pathways, proof of insurance, proof of extermination services products, running water sink within 20 feet of treatment room or germicide product in the room, toilet within single door entry establishment or if in single roof multiple business area within 300 feet. Clean and sanitized facilities, vent or window and bathroom with proper equipment, adequate supply of drapes, and they go even further when you read into it what the adequate supply of drapes is. Um, if you are seeing an average of one person a day, I think it says something like you need to have enough for two weeks worth. So they're assuming maybe you're only doing your laundry every two weeks, I don't know, but they would then want to see that you had like 14 sets of drapes there. Um, or more if you're seeing a lot more per day. Um, demonstration of clean soiled linen care. So you need to definitely have a laundry basket. Table surface, no accumulation of lubricant, inspected fire extinguisher in good order. That is something I got, um, not cited for, but they just said, hey, your, your uh, fire extinguisher isn't up to date. And it was just something that I didn't do, the owner was supposed to do. And it, we just didn't call and they come out and they say, yep, your fire extinguisher is fine. And they punch your tag and that's fine. But there's just all these little things that you have to be aware of. Um, with the, uh, what was it? Demonstrating of clean and soiled linen care. Your soiled linens must have a lid. Yes. It can't just be like an open laundry basket. Yeah. And actually, I don't think that they require that you have laundry facility on site because we didn't at Lotus Pond. I was taking it at home to launder yeah, daily, wheel. though. No. It left with me daily. It didn't stay in there overnight. Part-time job holding laundry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> uh, renewing your license. So active licensure. You are in compliance with CEUs, and those stand for continuing education and want to practice for compensation if you choose to do so. An inactive licensure, you do not intend to practice for compensation and may or may not have taken the required CEUs. So active, you've got to meet all those things, including the CEUs, because you want to get paid. Delinquent licensure, and this is important to note, you do not respond to your renewal notice or make any effort to renew. You don't give the board any money. So you can go inactive. But you can also go delinquent if you haven't paid them. They're gonna, they, they want their money. So delinquent, you do not respond to your renewal notice or make any effort to renew and you don't give the board any money. After all that work, why wouldn't, why just keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> so you may go inactive for two bienniums and then go null and void. If you are delinquent, the licensure will be null and void at the end of the biennium you failed to renew it in as either an active or inactive practitioner. You may switch one time in the biennium, active to inactive or inactive to active. So you can only choose 
to take a leave and go inactive once during that two year period or go from inactive back to active once in that two year period. You can't kind of go back and forth. Why would you want to be inactive? Um, so let's say your husband is going overseas for the military and you know you're going to be out of the country for a year and a half. Mm -hmm. You could go inactive and you wouldn't have to pay the renewal fee if that year, if that year and a half uh, overlapped with the renewal time. But when you come back to the States and you turn it active again, you have to have all your CEUs complete and you have to pay the fee, the okay. 105 to, to turn it back on. So what a lot of people will do is just, they'll just leave it active and they'll just do CEUs online or something like that. But there are many, like let's say you had cancer and you know you're not gonna be able to practice for an extended period of time, you could put your license inactive. So it's still there, it's just you can't do massage for money. Yeah, so if they were overseas, they probably could not have done the required live CEUs that were approved by the state of Florida to keep it active. So they needed to go inactive and then when they switched it, do everything they needed to bring it up to, to par to become active again. Um, so you can go inactive. Um, you may switch one time during the biennium, active to inactive or vice versa, at which point you would have to show proof of CEU compliance for active licensure. So like Dave said, you'd have to make sure that you caught up on any of those missing CEUs that you needed. We have biennial licenses. Uh, Christina mentioned this earlier, which means they are good until August 31st of every odd year. Okay. So every odd year, August 31st, so you know way in advance when you have to renew. Don't wait until August to do those CEUs. CEU providers make a lot more money that last month or two before renewal because I can't tell you how many LMTs wait until the last minute to, to continue all those CEUs, which also cost more in those last two months too. Oh, yeah. The department should send you a renewal notice in May. I was in the middle of moving and stuff. I didn't get it, but guess what? I still had the responsibility to make sure I knew it was due August 31st and everything was current with my, uh, with my fingerprints and everything. You can either renew by mail or online. Either way, you need to acknowledge that you are in compliance and either attach a check and mail it in, or you can use a credit card online. I think most of us do online these days. So With simple. CE broker and everything showing that you've got all your CEUs reported and everything, you just go in online, pay your money, you get something right away that shows that you renewed it until you get your new paper license in the mail. Okay. Hey, kitty. Yeah. Um, really excited because I got rid of two cats. So she's been all over me because she just doesn't want those kitties. <laughs> um, with CE Broker, it makes life so much easier because you can't physically renew. It will not allow you to click renew on the uh, Department of Health website until you have all of your CEUs complete. So if you wait to the last minute and you're waiting for them to report and you get closer and closer to the 31st, you know, you're going to kind of be nail biting a little bit. Um, but if you do them beforehand, it loads everything up. They report to CE broker. CE broker tells the state they're good to go. You pay your little fee. Easy peasy. Used to be before they had CE broker that you would have to, you know, they basically just went on faith. Like, yep, I did my CEUs. Um, but they could turn around and audit you and you would have to turn around and get all of your certificates from whatever you had done and shown, you know, Here's this hour, I did this here, this hour here, you, these hours here. Um, so CE Broker's really been great. We're lucky to have it. So, and you need to also just verify those places that are approved for Florida. <coughs> Excuse me, and you, you, you have to make sure. I got zapped. Um, unfortunately, I paid for when I did my infant massage training CEU, and it said it was approved, to, uh, an approved CEU provider. I didn't read teeny, weeny, weeny, weeny little writing that exempted like three states, including Florida. Florida had not approved their curriculum yet. I went last and year. And it didn't count as my live. Now it did count as part of my anytime hours, which will kind of break down what the requirement is, but it did not count as my 12 live. And this was like a 36 hour DEU that I did that didn't count towards any of my live because I didn't read the little print. 
And I've also done um, CEU training before when I did my uh, uh, post isometric stretching um, CEU that they're required within 30 days to put it in CE broker. And after like three months, it still wasn't there. The department didn't care that it wasn't reported. I had to follow up with them. They claimed that I'd given them the wrong license number. It still took them it took like almost five months before this company finally reported my CEU. So you have to double check it and make sure they're there. And just to make you even angrier, I teach CEUs. I upload people's CE credits <laughs> on CE Broker. It is the easiest thing. Of course, it takes two seconds. I type DVD. in your license number. It autofills your name and everything. And if I have my roster, I just double check that, that that's your correct name. And it already knows what class I'm reporting for, so it already knows how many hours and everything. So I literally type in your license number, it's brainless. verify, submit. Yeah. It's done. It literally takes me three, maybe five seconds. Yeah, I've had it. I've I've had it report day of before, where they, they had just a small enough class. Normally, when and they I'm went, teaching <laughs> in-person classes, I have it reported to their CD broker before they leave the building. Yeah, this was the weekend that it was the last of the renewal period, yeah. and we were in there no, doing this hot stone. Take a little longer. I mean, I'm talking about me in a class with three to six other people mm -hmm. here, but I'm I'm telling you, it is not hard to report to CE Broker. You just want to follow up and check and make sure they're being reported throughout that two year period because if you waited till the weekend of, and then found out that those twelve hours didn't count, like I found out way in advance that I had to do twelve more. But when would you find time to do it before your renewal deadline and stuff? So you just have to be diligent and checking on everything. Um, CD, um, we're going to go over that. It's twenty four, but it varies a little bit depending on when you like your first time versus your others. So CU stands for Continuing Education Unit. Sometimes you'll see continuing education hours. Um, we talked about it's, it's verified through CE Broker and it's all automatic. Um, since each of you, each of us may be audited, keep records of it. Keep those online receipts that you paid for it, that you finished it and stuff like that in case for some reason it doesn't show up or there's a glitch in the system later on. Keep that proof that you continued, you completed those hours for up to four years. Um, a CEU is equal to one clock hour, 50 minutes of uninterrupted instruction in a 60 minute period. They have been approved for webinar correspondence, videotape instruction and audio tape instruction. If it counts towards your renewal, you must take it during your time of licensure, not before you got your license. Like I have students ask all the time, can I take CEUs now? And I'm like, sure, they won't count towards your required CEUs you need to renew because you're not licensed yet. You'll be gaining some extra education, you know, that you'll have right off the bat, which is never a bad thing. But you can't bank hours. But you can't bank them. hours. Um, and you can't bank them for future renewals either. Yeah, so um, whatever you do in that renewal period, like, yay, you did 80 hours of continued education, but it only counts August 30th first comes around, you're back to zero. Now you got to start over for those next two years. So. They have to be approved by the Board of Massage. You're going to find sometimes CEs, continue education, that's for yoga. Yep, that's for yoga, for, um, for the, the board that regulates yoga and stuff like that. You have to make sure that it is a Board of Massage approved CE or CEU. Last year I went to a continue board education. Board of Massage for Florida. For Florida. Because you could absolutely... You could absolutely go to Georgia and take a CEU in Georgia and you get the knowledge and the information and the skills, but it doesn't count for your license renewal. Unless Which is what happened years. to me with my infant one. Yeah, so just, it's, now what I will tell you is this, they don't hide the information. I mean, they'll make it clear what states they're approved for, but before you jump in and put money down, you just need to double check and make sure that they are approved for the Florida Board of Massage. You can still go anywhere and get the knowledge and the information, but if you want credit, you gotta double check. Now, most of the big ones, like through AMTA and stuff, they go through and they get them approved for all the states, but if it's an individual, you do. You need to verify that it's approved in your state. The one I did was not in Florida, um, 
but they were improved in almost everywhere but like three states and that was you know my oversight i am um, i did a cupping continuing education last year and when we got to the course the instructor had to make an announcement that for georgia she was uh qualified to teach for florida porta massage and georgia porta massage but georgia had changed their rules to take out uh traditional chinese medicine so cupping was no longer a uh, recognized modality in the state of georgia and so they weren't going to get um license renewal hours for their class and they found it out day of so yeah you know you just have to be really diligent so if you were audited and not in compliance you would be charged $25 per hour for each CEU you did not take. So of those 24, I don't know, what's 24 times 25? I don't do math. 24 <laughs> divided by 4, six, 600 bucks? Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Something like 600 bucks, which I don't have 600 bucks sitting around. I don't know about you, but not for the state. <laughs> um, you would be unable to practice until your proof is given and approved and you must take them. So this is important to know. You must be in compliance with your CEUs in order to renew your license. It won't let you now, it's, but it's all digital and online. It's one per month of licensure, <coughs> not to exceed 25 per biennium. Now, this is where a lot of students get confused. You're not required to take one every month. If we're a two-year renewal and you're required to do one per month, that means 24 hours during that two year span. It doesn't mean you have to do one per month. I'm doing and one the, CEU a day. Not to exceed month. 25 doesn't mean you can't go over 25. It just means it doesn't count. I did the 100 hour okay. Thai massage training. It just, the other 70s, well extras. only 12, the only 12 count, 12, 18 counted. Mm -hmm. 12 live and six anytime is all that counted of that 100. So you yeah, can go year year over it just 36. Doesn't count. Um, those renewing for the first time, their CEU requirement will be based on the months licensed. So as a new licensed LMT, if you say got your license in August, September, October, that's two months less, you would only be required to do 22 hours during that 22 months that you were licensed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, or if you were only licensed for eight months and then it was time to renew you'd only be required eight hours i have a question if you okay sorry you had said earlier that <coughs> you, like fine 25 dollars for each ceu if you're not compliant what yes 25 per hour if, so like if you don't take the ceus they're going to charge you 25 dollars an hour or if you take the wrong one if you lied which yeah. now it's kind of impossible to yeah, do yeah. now that it's all online, that, this but it's was still when it was there. Self-reporting, and you said, yeah. "Yeah, I did my 24 hours, and you only did 20 for those four hours that you lied about. You get a fine for not being compliant. Plus, 25 times four, there's 100 bucks. Plus, you still had to take them before Plus you, could you get your license. Plus, you still have to take them before you get your license. So you, you you fall delinquent, and it's just the domino effect of fines that follow that. Um, I have found uh, the to get your first 12 live hours, Premier is really good. And they're kind of like look and learn sample classes. They have, they have a bunch of them and you can usually get all 12 hours in a weekend. And they're, they're more like a symposium style. Um, some of them will hand, have hands on, some of them won't, but it, it's kind of like an hors d'oeuvre into a modality. Um, I found out about Bamboo Fusion there, did the look and learn and then went and decided to do the 16 hour full course. Although we do offer them here and as a student, you'll get a discount okay. on your CEUs. That's awesome. so, and we're really, really, really cheap our CEUs compared to other places. So when you get your license the first time, the 24 is different. It's the number of months you were licensed, but say it's less than six months. You finish, you get your license and four months later, it's time to renew. If it's less than six months, there are no CEUs because you were just licensed for less than six months before that renewal happened. So that's the exception. How Does that make sense? Be, no. How can it be six months before your renewal when your license is two years? Well, because what if you finish school six months before August 31st of the odd year and you get your license and boom, six months later, it's August 31st, 2021. 
right? Like if, if, if someone was to start the course and they finished next year, 2021 in May. So that would put them at only three months before the renewal. The renewal is always August 31st of the odd year. So, so you're very so for a year or is it every two years? Every, every two, two years. years. But what if you finish school only three months before the renewal period of August 31st, 2021? You've been licensed for three months. That's not two years. Right. For three months. So you wouldn't because you're not you're not renewing. Renewal is every two years. You're new licensed. Now you're renewing on August 31st. Every two years you renew. Okay. So it's only different when you're a new newly licensed you just got your license doesn't matter when you just got your license august 31st of the odd year it's due to renew it could be eight months it could be just when you months. first get your license right yeah only when, right. Right. Okay. only when you first get it right only when you first get it if the license is less than six months then there are no ceus anything over that you're responsible for Say you were licensed 12 months and then the renewal period hit 12 CEUs. So let's talk about those 24 once you're renewing every two years. Those 24, 12 must be in a classroom environment hands-on live of the 24. Six can be any time, any way. They can be online classes. And then there are six CEUs that are mandatory for all of us. They'll be exactly the same for you, for me, for Christina, for Dave. And those are medical errors, ethics, and Florida law. There's two hours for each. Two for medical errors, two for ethics, and two for Florida law. Those six hours, every renewal period are always the same for all of us. Are and, required. And closer to renewals, um, uh, uh may ish they start sending out like little booklets they do it for skincare they do it for massage and it'll say um renewal courses for continuing education for massage therapy and it'll state what it has on the top of it um usually they have like an extra topic in it um but it'll have your medical errors ethics and florida law and all right, it's a little book. I do the test. You log onto the website, you copy your test into their digital format and submit it, and it's, you, there's your certificate. It's done. Those um, usually cost like ten or fifteen yeah, they're dollars not, each. They're, those six. I think the most I paid is sixteen. Now I have found though, like what she was saying, if I've gone and done like a twelve-hour training somewhere that cost me two hundred ninety-five dollars or whatever, they'll in order to try to entice you to come take their CE, they'll say. We'll throw in these six required for free and you just mm -hmm. go on and you do it and through their easy. site. So they'll throw those six required ones that are like 10 or 15 bucks in for free to try to get you to sign up for their big CEU. Um, but sometimes cause it's 10 bucks a pop or whatever, or 15 bucks a pop, I do them through AMTA and they're cheaper. I usually get those out of the way right away. Yeah. Two years before they're ever going to be due. So I don't have to think about them again later because they're cheap and they're easy to, to finish. But those six are the same for everyone. Medical errors, ethics, and Florida law. That changed when I first started. One of them used to be HIV AIDS. Now that's not part of it because the way it's treated and the way people are able to live their lives with HIV and AIDS is totally different. And now. there is um, an initial licensure of human trafficking training. There is. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, there's been some changes to the laws too. Um, a couple months ago, Claiborne. A couple of months ago, yeah. With the 2020, they're, they're not going to affect your test here or anything, um, but they may come up by the time you're ready to roll around to your MBLEX. I think the biggest thing is now a, um, a manager of a spa has to actually be an LMT before it could just be random person hired as a manager, like at Hand and Stone or Massage Envy, our manager was not an LMT. Now one of the managers on site has to be an LMT. And the other big change is that human trafficking signs, awareness signs have to be hung up in conspicuous places. I think those are the only, yeah, the only some, two changes, some of the more recent changes. that um, are gonna be different than the packets that you're gonna have from us online. We still haven't been able to get 
copies of those to post in our hands. Um, but um, is there anything else? Is that it for? I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, we already explained how we're different than um, Cosmo and skincare in that we are not the Board of Professional Regulation. We're Department of Health, so no tips. And we went over establishment license and places that were exempt. Yeah. Do you have any questions? Nope. Nope. Well, we're going to move on to some chair massage then. Do you want to start out with that? Sure. Um, I just wanted to punctuate that the Massage Practice Act itself is a very dry read, very litigious uh, vocabulary, but it's very important information to learn. And so having that study guide to kind of decipher it and exactly what they mean is really, really helpful. Let me grab my chair stuff. All right. So um, we talked about this, but let's go over it again while she's grabbing her stuff on MindTap. For the Florida law we just went over, you're going to find the chapter 480, the 64B7. You're going to find the study guide, which is where the highlights are that we were teaching from. And I think there's a Kahoot, and then there's the exam. All that, if it's not, if Dave hasn't opened it up yet, it will be. So now we're moving on to chair massage, and while Christina gets started, I'll write down some of what's on MindTap for that. And so you'll have access to the chair packet see with the picture and whatnot on there. Woo! Almost lost it. Um, there's some highlights in here. Um, I know you probably don't have it printed out, so just take notes as to what we say and that will correspond with um, testing. So um, you haven't done any hands-on with chair, but um, you will. You will. When, when normalishness is restored, um, have you ever had a chair massage, like at the mall or anything? Mm -mm. No? Mm -hmm. Naughty. <sighs> Stacy. I just had the regular massage, like at Hand and Stone. Okay. All right. Well, you've seen a chair though, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. So where you put your face down into the face cradle and your knees are kneeling into the pads and they have their arms resting, so you're kind of in this position so you can access the back of the body. Mm -hmm. Um. You'll get very familiar with um, setting up a chair and breaking down a chair and the proper body mechanics to do that. Uh, the uh, body mechanics for doing that, you, you need to take care of your body and make sure that you're not straining and hurting yourself to do that. Um, so some of our objectives here after we go through this is to list the major, major considerations when purchasing a massage chair do you want to know like what little nuances between chair to chair that you're going to want? Um, do you want it to be adjustable for tilting or do you want it to have a, a high capacity weight limit or do you want it to be very lightweight because you're going to be traveling a lot with it place to place? Um, you want to describe the types of seated massage equipment. State the reasons why a seated massage therapist might choose to massage a client in a seated position. Explain and demonstrate procedures of sanitation and hygiene. We, we need to make sure we know how to clean and what to clean and what to clean with. Um, properly adjust the chair for the client because even though it's got minor adjustments, one of those minor adjustments might make it much more comfortable from one person to the next. Um, describe the proper body mechanics and safety considerations for the massage therapist who uses massage chair and use adaptive professional communication to effectively communicate with the client before and during the massage and then ultimately performing a basic chair massage routine. You want to read the whole thing? Um, I don't know that we have to. We can probably just kind of go over the most important parts or the highlights, right? Okay. It's up to you. We've All got right. Like 50 minutes. So um, I'm just going to start with the first highlight, but to give you a little bit of an introduction. Massaging a person's shoulders while he or she is sitting in a chair is often instinctive. Um, I don't know when my husband's sitting at the uh, breakfast table and I just on his shoulders. 
that's just an instinct for me but it's just so easy to access top of the shoulders upper back neck i mean it's just an easy access point so when you um have them in a massage chair it's it gives you access to this person um without having the uh dress down factor for some of the more modest people so that's an option for them um seated chair massage is often referred to as chair massage and came to prominence through the efforts of david palmer whose vision was to make massage therapy safe for everyone anywhere anytime and he introduced seated massage in the workplace in the early 1980s so that's something you're going to want to write down your packet says 1908 which is incorrect that's a little typo <laughs> david palmer 1980s he introduced seated massage in the workplace in the 1980s that's david palmer not not arnold <laughs> All right, and so um, he started working at corporations such as Apple Incorporated and Pacific Bell. So that's going back into the 80s when Pacific Bell was still a thing. Um, he developed the idea for chair to complement the massage, for a chair to complement massage. So he's the one that created an actual ergonomic chair to put someone in instead of having them, you know, elbows on a table sitting in a regular desk chair or a dining chair or whatever. In 1986, this is a highlight we have here, the first special massage, first, ugh, the first special chair and coin term on-site massage, right? Palmer adapted the traditional Chinese system, oh my God, system of massage called AMA to create massage routines performed on the client in a special portable chair. And all that last part was important. 1986 is when he introduced the first special chair. He's the one that coined the term on-site massage, and it involves traditional Japanese system of massage called AMA, A-M-M-A. -M -M -A. And so you'll see like in um, Japanese paintings of uh, their traditional bathhouses, people sitting on really low stools and those would be the type of stools that they were using for massage. So at you, chair massage, we're using a combination of those acupressure, acu uh, compression points of AMA along with Swedish massage mm -hmm. techniques. It's a combo of both. Yeah. Um, we also use topotment in chair massage. It's really effective and you, you have a lot of power because you are perpendicular with your person as opposed to being over a table doing your percussion and you kitty's pushy <laughs> and if i put her down she bites so oh <laughs> she might not like the speaker my cat has a fit when there's voices on speakerphone who's it all up in my face who is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay um so i talked about a little bit this a little bit about this earlier um some of the more modest people might uh, prefer chair massage to traditional massage because they don't have to disrobe. There's no need to disrobe, no lubricants are used, and people generally feel less vulnerable seated in a chair than lying on a table. Um, and the time commitment is considerably less, especially when the therapist goes to the client's place of business or on site. So they don't have to take time to go to a place um, they don't have to disrobe, so they have that comfort level. Some people just don't enjoy table massage. They prefer a chair massage. Um, it's also some people's mobility issues. Some people can't lie flat, so a chair might be a better option for them. So um, sessions are usually short, typically 5 to 15 minutes, although they can last as long as 30 minutes which makes chair really affordable um, for a lot of people who maybe cannot afford a full hour massage. They can get a chair massage for about 10 to $20 because the, the normal average is about a dollar per minute. Um, so like she was saying, there's no need to disrobe. There's no use of lubricants. That's important to know. Um, and as she said, they feel less vulnerable, but it's also, 
a really great way to introduce yourself. Um, I don't even know if this is in the highlights, but um, this is going to be how you're going to sell yourself as a therapist. If you go to a chair event and you don't have every single person asking for every single last business card that you took, start practicing your chair because they're going to say, where do you do full body massage? Can I get a card? This is your teaser for them as to what's to come. So not only is it accessible to people who maybe don't want to get on the table, this is going to show people how good you are and get them to want to book. And when I go to, if I'm working for someone else as a third party at a chair event, I'm obviously not booking clients there, but if I'm representing me at an expo or an event, I always have a sign that says sign up today and save like $20 off your first massage. And I make sure I buffer enough time in between my massages. So I'm not just making money there to actually get them booked right then and there for their one hour massage when they ask about it and market myself like crazy that way. Yeah. Um, I would do, uh, some people do half fairs. off. I would do health fairs and I would just do quick little five minute intro and I wasn't charging for the chair. It was essentially like, here I am, this is my work. And I mean, I had a stack of business cards, probably that big at a 55 and older community in a teeny tiny town and they were all gone. And I, I drummed up a lot of business that way and it made some long-term clients just by five minutes on a chair. When I've had some students say, I don't like chair massage. I don't like chair massage. I'm like, learn to like it, learn to like <laughs> it and get good at it because it's going to be how you can sell yourself. And if you have downtime in between clients and things like, I mean, in between building your business and getting busy, there are companies out there that when I go for one of those third party companies where I don't have to call a client and arrange anything, I make $40 an hour just to show up with my chair for a two hour or six hour event every two weeks deposited directly into my bank account. So you can also make good money doing chair massage. 40 an hour is the going rate to go out to a business and massage. Or if you are at a salon or spa and you do have some downtime, you could set up in the um, entryway lobby area and just kind of, you know, remind the regular clientele like, hey, I'm here and these services are available too. So that's a good way to, to access people that are already in your foot traffic if you're at an establishment. So I don't usually give away massage, um, but at the yoga studio, when I was first building my business there, I would only five minutes, not 10, not 15, mm -hmm. just long enough for them to be like, ah, oh, it's over. I would give five, I'd have them sit because they've been in there sitting, studying, because they did yoga teacher training long enough for me to do like five minutes of neck and shoulder they wanted to book. Mm -hmm. So you can even use it in that environment. Like she said, set up. Maybe you're not charging a dollar a minute. You're just doing hand and arm if that's what's accessible while they're getting their hair done or setting up as they're leaving for a quick five minutes. By the way, this service is here. Here's my card. You know, if you book today. It's chairs wonderful and, and, and dreadfully underrated by some therapists, but it's such a useful tool to display yourself to a current clientele of wherever you are and new clientele that's not familiar with massage. It's And once you learn good body mechanics, like I hated chair in the beginning, but now if I could do chair instead of table massage, I can go do a seven hour event and the only thing that hurts me are my feet, you yeah. know, because I can get in there without blowing out my thumbs and anything else. And, uh, it's easy on my body because I'm leaning into them and we'll show you all of that once we're allowed to start doing hands-on and everything. Um, but I've gotten to where if I could just do chair all day and make three, four hundred dollars, I would probably be happy. But uh, I don't know. I still like table massage the best, but chair has its attributes and value. Yes. But I prefer to do I did too, and I still do for some clients, but when I'm having to do a lot of, yeah, I've gotten to where my body likes chair better, I guess is what I could say. All right. um, did we do this? We did all right, promotional tool. We won't go over the how to select a massage chair because we'll go over that when we go over your chair paper assignment in just a minute. Can I do that part? Sanitation hygiene. Okay. C 
sanitation and hygiene considerations. So we're a little more hyper vigilant on sanitation and hygiene now with everything that's going on, but it was still important before as massage therapists to make sure that you aren't spreading stuff person to person. It's not um, the hygienic to have somebody sit down on a massage chair, have them get up and just have somebody sit down right behind them. You need to clean that chair. Um, now cleaning the chair doesn't mean the entire chair top to bottom. It means all the vinyl. You don't have to go into the frame and do the tubing and, and the little knobs and all that. You, you just need to, the, the places that the client is touching. So the armrest needs to be done, the leg parts need to be done, the seat, <coughs> the face cradle, the chest pad. All of that needs to be wiped down with the appropriate disinfectant. Um, uh, you can use Lysol wipes, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I think you can if they're the ones that have the higher, the percentage of antimicrobial in them. Right, they just have to be the appropriate cleanser. You can't just, they have to have a percentage. You can just use Windex. <laughs> all that stuff in there. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. The, uh, it must have the ability to um, kill the organisms, staphylococci, streptococci, the common cold, influenza viruses, herpes virus, human immunodeficiency virus, and tuberculosis. And it wouldn't surprise me if they made a caveat and put corona on stuff now. Yeah, well, if it has to clean tuberculosis, we're checking it anyways because that's mm -hmm. highly contagious. But um, did you do the face cradle, the legs, and all that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it's off, always important for hands, especially now. So since you can't wash them, there are, you know, there's hand sanitizers and all that kind of stuff too. Yeah, keeping that on site with you before and after each client. Um, making sure that you're not touching one person, touching another. Yeah, because there's not usually a place to wash your hands at all. And I think we go, do we? I guess that wasn't in there. The thing with the disposable wipes was in here or no? Oh, disposable towels to sanitize your hands. Yeah, those exist now and or the hand sanitizer because like you can't hands. wash your hands, yeah, in between. Yeah, I prefer the sani hands just because you're wiping as opposed to just relying on contaminant being neutralized, personally. Yeah, and I usually keep um, like shea butter or something that I immediately put on as soon as I've sanitized my hands because if you're at a chair event and I've done been known to do like 30 something massages at a chair event and all you're doing is sanitizing and not moisturizing, you're gonna hate your hands later. So I always make sure I keep a lotion or something that I, I can keep it. moisturizing my hands on because they get really dry with all that alcohol and hand sanitizer. Yep. Um, you want to have some safety considerations and body mechanics for the seated massage therapy. Uh, you don't want to just stand there and you know slunch over. You want to make sure that your shoulders are back and erect. You can't see me, but I'm in a lunge position. And that's something we'll go about showing you more of when you are in class. Um, but Having your proper body mechanics saves your body so you can work longer, you can work more competently when you use proper body mechanics. And I showed that a little bit in, um, in skincare when we were doing the hand and arm massage. Do you remember that? I'm sorry, I'm spacing out. <laughs> <laughs> body mechanics. Body mechanics. When I was doing the hand and arm massage, how I wasn't just doing a hand and arm massage, I. I was kind of step back and yeah. yeah, and that's really something that we have to show you in person. Yeah. Um, but in order to be able to use good body mechanics, and this is an important highlight, you have to be able to find an area that allows you to move completely around the chair for the massage. If you pack in right next to somebody, then you are going to be massaging like this and instead of being able to get in that stance. So when we actually allow you to set up the chair and all, cause we're allowed to do hands on, we usually have you grab like the face rest and do like a little pirouette, a little circle around yeah, make in sure. order to make sure you have that room to move, whether you're working on the arms or the hands or from the front of the chair, that walking distance around the chair. You're not bumping into tables, you're not bumping into walls, you're not bumping into other people that are doing chair as well. 
And you also, part of that making sure you have room to walk around it is putting away any of the gear so that your client has a safety for the client because their safety is first. It's important to note they need to have a clear, unobstructed way to get to and from the chair so they don't trip and fall over anything as well. Part of your safety precautions. And then, as she mentioned, working in the lunge stance, that's the most common stance. That's an important highlight too. Most common stance that you use for seated massage. Sorry, I saw it. That's okay. <laughs> and you'll find when we start doing body mechanics, when you're in that lunge position, then instead of using your arms to work and wearing out your shoulders and everything, you're able to rock and use your body in a way so that you have momentum and it's effortless instead of this and making everything sore. So when I massage, I'm just leaning into people and making it feel comfortable and good for me as well. Um, everything she mentioned about being upright and straight. Um, being, bracing your thumbs, that's not a highlight on here, but we'll go over this even when you're on the table all the time. If you do this, you're gonna blow out that saddle joint in your thumbs that you wanna brace your thumbs when you're going in there with thumbs. Okay. I tend to do a lot of elbow or knuckle or things like that now because I used to have a really bad habit yeah. of this and I got clicky thumbs now. When I'm working on clients, especially hands where I'm doing a lot of this, they'll, they'll say, oh, is that you cracking or me? I'm like, that's me, that's all my fingers <laughs> cracking. You know? yeah. um, so that's a good habit to never start. Don't yeah. rely on your thumbs, you know, moving. Support them and use them that way. That way you'll have use of them longer. Um, you also want to uh, support your wrist. Don't overextend your wrist one direction or another. You wanna kind of keep your joints stacked up. And what I mean, behind, mean by that is my elbow is behind my wrist and my shoulder is behind my elbow, so I can really lean into it instead of, now I'm straining my wrist here, right? Mm -hmm. so, and we'll, we'll talk more about that when we're in person. It's a little easier to explain. Um, I think we're here. Yeah, uh, before the seated massage begins, if this is your client's first time to sit in a massage chair, show them how to do it, because they're gonna get in and sit in it like, uh, like a chair and with their backwards with their bottom on the seat and their back against the chest pad and their head laying in the face cradle like this um, <laughs> So they need a little ways. they need a little instruction um, And just demonstrate quickly kind of hover over the chair, you know you're, you're gonna sit like this straddle here legs go here your arms will rest here and your face will go down like this you know? Oh, okay, you know light bulb pops on yeah. and they get it no, just explain it to them, but show them physically while you're explaining to them. Your knees go down here on these pads, your bottom sits here, your chest comes forward, your forehead is gonna rest here, and you show them how to get on and off of it. So, and once they are on the chair, um, you will have to adjust it for that person. Now, some of those adjustments can be made while they're still in the chair. Some of them may need to be made with them back off the chair. So if you need to raise and lower the uh, seat height, it's going to require them to get up. Um, and you wanna make sure that when they do get up, because it's kind of awkward with the seat between their legs stepping back, especially for the older clientele, you wanna make sure that you're there, just kind of like, okay, I'm here if you start to teeter back a little bit. Cause it, it's an awkward little step. Yeah, I usually hold the face cradle like this because I've had people take yeah. the whole chair the over push if they're not the careful and then I support them stepping back mm -hmm. if they get off. And if I have somebody who is to the point where they just don't physically look like they can get up and off of the chair, then I'll come up with another option like a normal chair, mm -hmm. hugging a body pillow against a table or something because you, like it's liability it's liability some people if they're elderly or they have any kind of um physical handicaps and things like that they may not even be able to get up or down but a majority of your adjustments um the seat will work for a lot of people and then from there it'll just be like raising the chest pad or tilting the face cradle uh for them to go closer to them um you may have to make accommodations for um breast tissue women with larger breasts, there's a, there's a specific wedge you can put in place or raising and lowering it. Just, 
so that they're not hunched over. What the cool thing about that wedge that goes through here too is that you can also use it down on the bar for men if they sit where the bar is uncomfortable on their personal area as well. I've had to do that before too. Yeah. Um, the only thing you don't uh, adjust are the leg, the leg heights mm -hmm. up and down. That's just a standard setting for most of them. I haven't messed with every single massage Face, chair, cradle, angle, and height, armrest, arm. cradle, and height. Um, but the ultimate goal is once they're on the table is that their back is straight, not, they're not hunched to get to the face cradle or, you know, their chest isn't on the pad. You want them leaning forward and straight. I know you can't see my body. I'm sorry. And that the armrest is high enough so that the shoulders aren't here, that their shoulders are down where you can access them. Mm -hmm. Um, once you've made all those adjustments, you just ask the person, is there anything that you could change to the adjustments to make it better? And if not, away you go. You wanna go there? Sure. So then we get into the massage strokes used for seated massage. We mentioned AMA earlier and then Swedish massage. So seated massage routines are East Asian and Swedish massage strokes without any oil or lubricant. Um, and those include compression, sustained pressure, acupressure, stretching. You can do stretching techniques and things like that. Deep and superficial friction, petrissage, effleurage, nerve strokes, topotament, as she mentioned, which is the percussion. The strokes used vary according to the training of the therapist. Um, the video that's gonna be on MindTap is gonna be a basic 15 minute routine. It's gonna show a little range of motion and or some stretches like winging the scapula. Um, but then once you've been here longer, we'll actually show you how you could take somebody into twists on the chair and stuff like that. So there's really a lot, including working the calves, the quads and things like that over time that you can add to, you can actually do quite a bit on the chair if you need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people think that they're relegated only to the back on the chair, but you can access the legs a lot as well. Um, and we'll go more into those strokes once you're here actually doing the hands-on part of it. For the test itself, it's just that that part I mentioned, some of those strokes are the petrissage, effleurage and stuff. And you can always come back to find these highlights that we're going over when you rewatch the video. Um, so I think now we just wanna get into how to adapt the communication. Do you wanna do that part? Because some, if their face is in the cradle or in, we're in a noisy place, we may, may not be able to hear them communicate and we have to look at their body language and or give them hand signals to communicate with us. Right, so whether that be a thumbs up or a thumbs down or um, in your, your chair paper here, they use a, using one, two, and three for the perceived level of um, pressure. And it just lets them, lets you communicate with them without speaking. So once they're in the face cradle, they don't have to, it's too much, you know, and it's loud or, or whatever. Um, it, it's, it's a foolproof way of just, you know, knowing exactly what your client is experiencing. Um, on a scale from one to five is, is going to be your, your, your pain scale. We don't want to bring anybody to five because that would be excruciating. Um, so, I live in one through three. I one think. through three, yes. So if they're on the scale that they use here, one is no pain, five is excruciating pain. So one to three, like Christina said, is our goal. Okay. Um, some clients will choose to, um, I don't want to be sexist here, but like large men, when they see a small woman or woman in general, kind of, oh, I can take whatever you can throw at me. And they will not communicate with you either verbally or with hand signals and they're like, I can take it. Um, but their body instinctually will tell you what's going on. And so you're working on their shoulders and they just kind of tense a little bit. And so that's going to be your cue to kind of adjust your pressure and go from there. Uh, they, the body can't lie to you. It's, it knows what's going on and it will set you straight. So even if you've got a, someone who's very, I can take whatever you got, your, their body will tell you what's going on. 
Um, I think that's pretty much it for the packet because the rest of it just kind of goes into a sample routine. Um, normally when you're here, we show you a routine like what we would do as teachers and then we teach you the cat lady video. The cat lady video is not on online. So we found a different 15 minute routine that you can watch. It doesn't mean that you have to learn or memorize that routine, especially if you don't have a chair at home to practice on someone. But if you do have somebody who you're social distancing with, and even if you don't have a massage chair, you can get them to sit hugging a pillow. You can always get ahead of the game and practice on somebody to that video and start to get comfortable with it, but you'll learn that hands-on when you um, actually are here in school once we're cleared um, to be able to start doing that. But there is a video on how to set up a chair. We found one as close to what our school chairs are, because that's part of what you get graded on when you do your evaluation. And then there's a 15 minute chair routine in addition to the, the packet and the, the chair paper assignment that we're about to go over. I'll let Christina go over it with you. So the chair massage research paper, they have this form, I believe. Uploaded. Yeah, it's online. So you'll see this form. It's got a little example of a chair and a carry-in case there. Um, and listed down here are some brands of chairs, well, massage product people and they just happen to make chairs. Um, so for this project, you will research three massage chairs and write a brief report about your findings. The purpose of this project is to expand students' knowledge about available massage chairs, the various brands within the massage mas supply market, and the various features and benefits of different models of chairs. So what that says is look up three chairs, tell me the pros and cons of them, right? I wanna know, they're they're lightweight. They're they're um, it comes in a lot of colors. The padding is 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 wonderful on this one. It's got a lot of adjustments. You know, tell me what you like about it. Tell me what you don't like about it. the price tag, the weight. It's a weight limit to have a person on it. Um, and then the assignment portion is each report must include one paragraph highlighting unique features of each massage chair selected, as well as one paragraph describing which of the selected chairs you would um, select and why. So why you like it, um, which, you, which one you like and why you like it. Ugh. So four paragraphs totally. Easy, Total easy. one for each chair, each of the three chairs, and then the fourth one summarizing which of those three you'd pick. What I can tell you is you need to write it in your own words. If we see a copy and paste from like an Amazon description, we're gonna give it back to you to resubmit and then it's gonna be day late if you submitted it the day it was due and lose points. So make sure you write it in your own words. No, we do have students, some students who just, and we can tell when it's a copy and paste, especially the wording and the verbiage that they use to describe it on Amazon. So just look them up and see that you, what it is that it says are the benefits of that chair and things like that. It's a pretty easy assignment. You can do it pretty quickly. Um, you can use three different brands of chairs. So you could choose Earthlight, Oakworks, and Stronglight or you could find uh, three Oakwork chairs and compare the differences between those. It's, it's totally up to you. There are some pretty cool chairs there's out there. Some, there are some, some wild ones. that swivel, like they're on this swiveling thing. So it's almost like the person is laying down. It's almost like you're doing a table massage, but they're clothed because the whole thing swivels down versus the normal, like typical seated chair. One of my students found some I didn't know existed that were for pregnant women. Uh, prenatal and bariatric where the whole chest piece and everything or the belly piece could adjust in and out to accommodate for belly size and things like that as well that I didn't know existed. The weight considerations depending on where you think you're going to be going. Some only limit you to 300 pounds, some are five or 600 pounds. And it depends on when you're pushing. You pushing on a person on a chair is going to you know, affect the weight capacity. And you're gonna find anywhere from like 129 bucks to like 1200 bucks. Mm -hmm. It's wild, there's chairs. tons of them out there. It's really interesting. So, um, it's a pretty easy paper assignment though. You may choose three brands in, uh, I said that. Uh, do not include electronic massage chairs such as those found at Brookstone. That is our caveat. That's <laughs> yes. tried. It's not a sit down <laughs> massage chair. It's you actually being able the one to that massage work the for me. <laughs> um, I think that was everything. Yeah, right. I think Do you have any questions on the chair massage packet? No. 
All right, so what we hit was just the highlights. Stuff because it's not in the chapter, it's just on the, I mean, it's just on the. Uh... When you get into the massage practice folder, mm -hmm. there at the very bottom, there should be a folder that says chair massage. If he should have unlocked it for you. <laughs> okay. So you're gonna see all the normal chapters, like under there, you're gonna see chapter 10, 11, 12, uh, 14, massage in a spa environment. At the very bottom, we created a folder that says chair massage. Okay, okay. And there'll be the- So these are, these are handouts not in the textbook, so. Yeah, they're not in the textbook. So they're PDFs of the paper and of the um, packet, as well as the Kahoot, the YouTube videos, so I'll, as soon as we say goodbye in a minute, I'll make sure that Dave has made all of those available to be seen, that he hasn't forgotten to open those up. Okay. All right, cool. Any Thanks questions for, for us? joining us. Oh, I got it. How's the baby? It's I, a girl. It's a girl. I found out. Yay. Was, uh, and I got a little bump going on. Yeah, she's got the little baby bump happening. So cool. A little bee head. It's exciting. <laughs> So Christine is going to be teaching you skeletal system when you, Wednesday? Wednesday. Is it your next Wednesday. one Wednesday? Mm -hmm. Yep. So oh. she'll be teaching skeletal. We'll be taking over more and more for Dave. We don't know yet about the school opening. We have to wait until the governor says whether or not everything is opening on the first or whether that's hey, being extended. For the rest of the year. Yeah. But public school is. But we're private. private. So you guys there is a chance now it'll be the same as before it officially closed down you'll have the option to continue distance learning or coming in um, if you're in it's just going to be lecture and because all the social distancing will still be in place we'll have to make accommodations for the hands-on when it's yeah. safe to do that part and the evals we're still pondering some ideas of how to accomplish that so um, we had a small, I'd say maybe 10% or 20% of the students coming in while we were still open. Mm -hmm. And then those who had children at home or felt like they needed to stay away from being in school continued the online. Mm -hmm. um, it may all be online if the governor comes back and says he's going to extend that shelter in place another week or two, I guess. The task force was meeting Friday and they had until the end of the day yesterday to give all their findings to him. So I imagine he's going to go through all that and make some announcements. Okay. But online will still be happening even when the school opens for those that choose not to be in person for a lecture. Okay. All right, thank you. I have right, a question. I'm sorry. Oh, who? Somebody else is there. It's me. Hold on one second. Sorry, I don't know how to use this. Okay, hi. 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 Um, so <laughs> I'm Lauren. I'm from the Fort Myers campus. Hi, Lauren. Hi. I didn't know Sorry. you were there. You've been here the whole time? I popped in um, like maybe like within the last five, 10 minutes. Oh, okay. So I was in the wrong section. So I forgot I was in section B and I just got moved to section A. Okay. So okay. I was in the wrong section for like three weeks doing that work and I was like freaking out. But, um, so I got an email from the Fort Myer, Nancy from the Fort Myers campus about my hours. Like I've been turning in all the assignments even when I was in the wrong section and I'm only getting credit for seven hours a day instead of eight. So she's like, you know, like you need to talk to somebody about that. But I don't even know who to talk to. I tried to email Mr. It Dave is seven and hours. Like, it is seven hours. That's what the normal work day is. Well, I'm a VA student and she says it's supposed to be eight and it could affect my like monthly funding because she, as of right now, it looks like I'm missing hours. So she said I need to talk to someone, but I have no idea who to talk to. Yeah, I would email Dave. Um, I will mention, um, are you in here under your name? Did you log in as your name? So we'll know. It's, well, I, my name is longer. I go by a shortened. It's Lauren Lee Moore. Lauren Lee Moore. Okay. Because it's my understanding, um, normal students get a seven hour, the curriculum that we've been putting in is seven hours worth of work. Um, yeah, I don't know where the laws. miscommunication is and I don't know why, but like I said, I'm a VA student. So if I'm yeah. not getting the full hours, like that affects the funding that I get every month and okay. they can, they can pull that. And I'm like, well, I've been, you know, doing all the assignments. I've been 
you know, at all the, you know, video chats and everything. I just, I don't understand how that can affect me if I've been doing everything I'm supposed to do. All right, I'll have him contact you directly. Yeah. Okay. We'll yeah, I emailed him yesterday and I forwarded the email that was sent to me, but I just, I okay. haven't heard it, so I didn't know. Okay, well, we'll, we'll make sure to punctuate that, make sure we're getting everything laid out properly for you. Okay, thank you. And this, and this will be uploaded to YouTube, your, um, so you can view online you chat, so you can see the whole lecture, because yeah. we did Florida okay. Law, and we did the chair, um, okay. and they're not in books, they're packets, they're PDFs, okay. so you can either do the highlights that we went through if, if you're printing out the PDFs, or take notes, and there are the highlights that are on the test, and there's cahoots mm -hmm. for both of them to practice as well, and then there okay. are some assignments if you weren't here for that part that go with the chair massage which includes the chair paper assignment um, and all that information is explained and if you have any questions you can email Christina or myself or Dave about the assignment okay. and there are also a couple of videos to watch on the chair as well okay thank you all right we'll get it squared thank away you. yeah we'll, we'll, we'll go talk to him as soon as we log out of here all right okay. thank you so right. much Thank you. All right. I don't know if you're still there, Stacey. But if you're still there, bye. 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 <laughs> okay. You guys have a good day, and um, Christina will be with you guys on Wednesday. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> How do bye. You stop it? <laughs> I don't know. End, End meeting. meeting. There it is. Bye, guys. End.